Welcome to Europe Inside Out. I'm your host, Rim Mumtaz. I'm the editor-in-chief of Carnegie Europe Strategic Europe, where we publish twice a week punchy, short analysis on all things strategic in Europe. And I'm delighted to be taking over hosting this podcast. After a landslide victory, Donald Trump will become the next president of the United States, marking a crucial turning point in the transatlantic relationship. Trump's win, driven by voters wanting lower inflation, tighter immigration controls, and less defense spending abroad, promises to upend the alliance with Europe and its decades-old core tenants. So, with Carnegie scholars Sophia Besch and Chris Schell, we will discuss the impacts of the shifts in the role Americans now want for their own country in the world, more protectionist, less committed to alliances, And we'll discuss whether those in Europe who think they can keep buying more American weapons to keep the American security guarantee are right. But before we get to that discussion, we're doing things slightly differently. For this first episode, we'll have two parts. In the first, we travel to the U.S. a week before the presidential election. We're taking you on the ground to meet some voters in Pennsylvania and in Connecticut, where there are massive weapons factories that export big-ticket items to Europe. We wanted to know if in communities in the U.S. that benefit directly or indirectly from European defense spending, the candidates' positions on the alliance with Europe is a main consideration when deciding how to vote. First stop, Pennsylvania. I'm here a week before the U.S. presidential election, which is presenting the American people with a stark choice when it comes to the relationship with Europe, the transatlantic alliance. On the one hand, Vice President Kamala Harris has expressed her commitment to the alliance. And on the other, former President Donald Trump has said that if Europeans don't pay more, and don't pay their fair share, then the U.S. is going to encourage Russian President Vladimir Putin to attack them. So I'm here to discuss the start choice with people from this community to see if, when they're deciding who to vote for, they're also thinking about the candidate's position when it comes to the alliance or supporting European countries against Russia or against any aggressors. So I don't like all the money that's going to them, obviously, but that wasn't the factor in me voting. Immigrants was the factor in me voting. Is that the only factor? I mean, the most important one? Major one for me. And, and I mean, spending the money in Ukraine um, and spending the money on immigrants and not the people in this country. You're sending billions and billions to people over there. That how, how is it going to benefit us? How, been, how is it benefiting us? You have the homeless people out here. You have mental ill people out, out here. You have to take care home before you can take care of anything else. We need billions. We, we the ones need billions of dollars. I need help. And these two women felt like Europe didn't protect the U.S. from immigration. So they should not be receiving so much American defense protection. They mention in particular German Chancellor Angela Merkel taking in in 2015, a million refugees, mostly from Syria. What an M, Marco or something like that. But, sure. So they got her out because they didn't want... That's what I'm saying. She had already ruined something them. Worked. That's what I'm saying. It works from within. Yeah. So if you have somebody working within and then all of a sudden you suddenly be broken. So now all this is coming, all this it's is coming happening. this way. Yeah. But so they That's fell the first. And in New York, I got it like, right. it, it broke. It, yeah. just, it got broken. And this is why... This is how it's happening. Right. So you so. feel like Europe gave in to immigrants and, yes. yeah, and it, right. has facilitated right. Right. the arrival to the U.S. Yes, right. something's right. going on. Right. That's that. what I'm saying. And, and that's somebody what I was trying to say. It was within. Yeah. And somebody said, somebody might have been, listen, I'm going to give you this, A, B, and C, but this is what needs to be done. I just, you know, money, you know what? Money rules everything. Somebody the plan has somebody, been in effect for years. Yeah, that but, they've somebody, been. but they pay, somebody paid somebody something. Right. But I think there was a plan in effect for years that's been playing for years, and it's slowly, slowly coming our that's way. what I'm saying. Clearly, all politics is local. And it works for the other side of the argument. A little further away in the same county, 
the benefits the U.S. derives from its alliance with Europe were front of mind. So I wanted to ask you, when you're thinking about how you're going to vote in on, on November 4th, is part of your consideration each candidate's position when it comes to America's relationship and alliance with Europe, especially the support that America gives Europeans and Ukrainians against Russia? So the short answer is yes, uh, but it's not so much acutely Russia. I just personally think about it because of a little bit being a student of history, armchair student, and personally, my family, what it went through, I sort of inc was inculcated uh, by sort of osmosis, if not expressly, but uh, that it is critical to have not just good relations, but for purposes of trade and support, even going as far back as, as arcane as it might sound, there's still vestiges of like the Marshall Plan after World War II. And that positioned the U.S. to be without any doubt the superpower. But to answer your question, does it play a role? It plays a role. Is it a, a, a sizable predominant? No, but I do sit back and it does have an effect on me being a little bit of a student of history, I know that any strong nation is one that has its, and this sounds a little colonial, but I'm, just, I'm not using the right word, but it has its tentacles uh, in a benevolent way uh, to be outreach supporting uh, financially, through trade, through diplomatic, uh, having really strong relations because I think that keeps you using NASCAR terminology in the pole position. I'm in Stratford, Connecticut. This is a blue town. It voted for Hillary Clinton in 2016, and it voted for Joe Biden in 2020. It's also a town where there's a big military helicopter factory that employs something like 7,000 to 8,000 people. And they export a lot of these military helicopters to European countries, especially Eastern European countries and Baltic states. And so I was curious to know if in a blue town, people are considering the alliance with Europe when they're deciding who to vote for. On the mainstream right by the helicopter factory, I find a local on his lunch break and we get to talking. As you're thinking about who to vote for uh, in this election... Are you taking into consideration the uh, candidate's position when it comes to the alliance with Europe and whether, you know, the U.S. would come to the rescue of these European countries if Russia attacks them? Um, no, that is not something that I've thought about during this election. How come? I, I don't know. I mean, there's just so many other things going on that I just think that that's being looked over, possibly. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Are you thinking about whether the U.S. needs to continue supporting the Europeans against Russia as Russia is attacking them? Is that a consideration for you? Yeah, I wouldn't say. I mean, I'll be very honest with you. It's not the top of my thoughts about the whole situation, but um, I am all about no war and peace. And, I'm, you know, I, I hate where we're at. What do you mean by that? Where are we right now? Like we're super divided. Everybody's divided. There's division everywhere. In America? In America. I think it's all over the place. I think it's all over the place. So I, I just want everything to be peaceful. I want everyone to get along. I know that's not always what it can be, but um, I'm all about no war. Some European countries think that the more they buy things that are like weapons that are produced in the U.S., the more America is going to basically support them and protect them. Do you think that's what America should be doing? Should it be continuing to protect the Europeans? I don't I don't know a lot on that. So I don't really want to speak on what I don't know about. Like I'll be honest with you. I'm not I'm not hundred percent on all that. But um I, I like I said, I'm all about the no war thing. I hate it. I, I just want everything to be peaceful. Peace is a word that came up often in my discussions, even though most hadn't thought much more about it. They hadn't thought about the importance of avoiding imposing a so-called peace on Ukraine that would also legitimize Russian President Vladimir Putin's violation of international law. Regardless, Donald Trump won the presidential election. One of his promises was to avoid World War III, as he put it, and to end the war in Ukraine, quote, within 24 hours. 
Which brings us to our expert discussion. So on this first episode of Europe Inside Out that I'm hosting, and that happens to be airing shortly after the U.S. presidential election, I'm really happy to be at Carnegie's global headquarters in Washington, D.C., and to have with me both of you, Zofia Besch, Senior Fellow at the Europe Program here at Carnegie and host of The World Unpacked, and Chris Schell, Fellow at the American Statecraft Program at Carnegie as well. And for this discussion, which we're going to have about basically Europeans buying American to keep America, so to speak, keep America engaged in the transatlantic alliance that has dominated the security architecture since the end of World War II. I really wanted to start with a question about how do you think the average American voter thinks about Europeans and the alliance with Europe when they're voting? And do they think about that? You know, I think it's important to start that, you know, there's layers to the conversation. There's, you know, the the D.C., you know, wonky, complex, abstract conversations about the European alliance. And then there's, I guess, the more like quotidian, you know, base level conversation. And from what I found in my own research and just from casual conversation, my own level of street journalism, you know, I think there is a, a respect and understanding for American alliances, you know, at, a, at the top line level. I, I would say that there's, a, like we saw from the election, that countries really split in half. There's a substantial amount of Americans, you know, regardless of class or race, who do understand that, hey, you know, the U.S. has a role in the world. It's a role of, you know, you know, ensuring peace, ad- adhering to alliances, you know, trying to at least contain uh, what we would call- consider adversaries. But then, you know, I hope this helps, but like, there's another half who— one can say have bought into um, President Trump's, you know, rhetoric around, you know, alliances being, you know, a form of usury, transactional. And I think what we saw in the election in particular was that that half who believe that or somewhat believe it, you know, kind of turned out and voted in mass. And I'll just say this one one more thing. I do think that in particular, I guess we'll get to it, you know, in terms of like the, the war on Ukraine, that there is a sentiment of like some of the polling that I've had that Americans are, you know, largely in favor of, hey, you know, let's let's give aid to Ukraine, assure that, you know, Ukraine's able to, you know, stay on their own two feet. But then unfortunately, you know, there is also an aspect of feeling, like I said earlier, about usury and, you know, money that's going overseas and the trade-off. Why are we doing this for what people would say guns and butter? So I guess in other words, for your audience, you know, money overseas can be used domestically. There's also the material concern about, you know, racial minorities overrepresented in the U.S. services, mm-hmm. military service. So there's also a, what if we go into a great power war with Russia? Would that then mean that, you know, we're now dying over this over this conflict? So I think there's those concerns. That doesn't necessarily mean that these groups don't care, which is more so of, I think, a better uh, ex- explanation of why this is happening and why it's important. Sophia? I might add that on your very interesting point about how to make the case for alliances. I think often the way that policymakers here make the case for alliances is implicitly a way of making the case for U.S. primacy and holding up the international world order through alliances and with mm-hmm. allies and with partners. And if you fundamentally don't believe that that should be what America is doing, then it's harder to make the case for alliances. And I think that is something that we have to take very seriously after this election, where I think after the first time Donald Trump was elected, there was maybe a response in, in Europe and among Democrats saying people don't understand the benefit of alliances. They bought into this rhetoric about protection records and you know, the Europeans aren't paying up in NATO and that's why we're just getting a bad deal. And then there was a lot of explaining that happened about how actually NATO doesn't work like that. And actually mm-hmm. we're all benefiting and actually the U.S. benefits. But I think this is the element that voters are questioning. Is, does the U.S. benefit and what is the what is the purpose for the U.S. of these alliances? And if it is upholding European security, if it is upholding the international economic order, if it is upholding U.S. primacy and they don't actually believe that that's what they want to do, then I think we have to take seriously that they're voting down on on those issues too. So we're recording two days after Election Day. The data, it's still coming in. But I think one thing we can all agree, or maybe you disagree with me, Mm -hmm. is that inflation was the single most dominant force in determining voting. It seemed like it's what carried Trump over the line with such a clear victory. 
while Kamala Harris had a hard time coming up with a message that resonated on how she would improve the situation on inflation. The reason why I think about inflation is because it's tied in a certain way, maybe subliminally, with this idea that former president and now president-elect Donald Trump has driven about how European countries that are rich, quote-unquote, Germany, France, take advantage, quote-unquote, of America, and how that needs to be rebalanced. So I wonder how much that seeps in with that voter that is, you know, hurting economically, even though obviously GDP growth and GDP numbers in the U.S. are much better than Europe. At the grocery store, things are very expensive, and that's driving people. So I think we have to be very careful in one factor explanations for what happened. In terms of the topics that influenced the vote, obviously inflation, the economy was the big one. The other big ones were immigration yeah, the border. and democracy. Mm. And then a little bit below that, abortion. But then foreign policy did actually, in some of the polls that we're seeing, play into, I think, the pitch that, that Donald Trump was Can making. Can you define how? How did that? What were the terms? I think the terms were his main pitch on foreign policy is deterrence and influence through strength rather than alliances. Bilateral relationships, not alliances. I think under foreign policy, you would probably also include things like tariffs, trade imbalances that he's obsessed with. But what I meant to say was that it was once again an incumbent versus change vote. Mm -hmm. And that the four years that Donald Trump was out of office helped him make the case that he was still the candidate of change Mm -hmm. and that Kamala Harris was seen as a continuation of Mm. Biden's policies and then Bidenomics and, and his economic policies but also everything else that he stood for, which was a very nostalgic view of U.S. primacy in the world and and of U.S. US positions in the world. And a lot of people are actually, you know, noting that most incumbents in liberal democracies have paid the price Mm -hmm. after COVID and and inflation. And I I have to say my other specialty is obviously Emmanuel Macron. And I I think it's really interesting that he was the only one who got re-elected he then suffered in other polls, mm. but it's not it's not the same situation. But I think you put it better than me. The whole idea of the trade dimension mm-hmm. that is actually connected very, very deeply in the Trump world and Trump messaging to tariffs and inflation. And that is a way to think about how foreign policy played that I think Maybe perhaps in Europe, we don't think about it in these terms. I wonder, Chris, what you think about that. Yeah, I mean, you did an excellent job of summarizing it. I'll just add one thing on the foreign policy aspect. You know, I, I believe that Trump was, quote unquote, you know, successful and able, trying, and able to characterize himself as an anti-war candidate. Mm-hmm. Not saying that's necessarily true, but I think, you know, when you talk about how the American, the average American voter— who's not deep in the weeds of international affairs, foreign policy, thinks about the U.S.'s role in the world. I think there is this aspect of U.S. involvement in overseas conflicts, Mm -hmm. you know, interventionism, especially when we kind of put in the broader context of global war on terror that you go go back to, you know, thinking about the incumbent, you know, there was the pullout of Afghanistan, which I think many can agree needed to happen, but I think it was a way in which it happened. And we even saw Trump, you know, play on that in the second debate about the botched withdrawal from Afghanistan, so on and so forth. And I think we even saw, you know, Trump is a very reductive way of doing it, but saying that I'm going to end the war in Ukraine. And people were asking, well, how are you going to do that? But I think Trump he didn't specify. He just said, I'm going to end the war in Ukraine. Did and he need to specify? No. And unfortunately, I don't think he did, especially when we're talking about, you know, people who are not in the weeds of these type of issues. All they need to hear is, you know, he's going to end the war in Ukraine. And I do think there was a way in which, and this is all hindsight 2020, in which Harris could have won up um, Trump in saying that, OK, I'm going to end the war, but I'm going to end it in this way that's going to benefit Ukraine. I think that could have been done. And, you know, she only had 100 days of separating herself mm-hmm. from from Biden. And I think that's also a very, you know, tall order, having 100 days 
which is really hard, where Trump pretty much had a whole year relatively to kind of li- make his case plain for American people. But so I say that all to say that if we're thinking foreign policy or international affairs, definitely this concept of U.S. involvement in world affairs, U.S. involvement in global conflicts. And American people, unfortunately, I don't think are really trying to hear this idea of, okay, we just ended Afghanistan, but we're going to get entangled in something else. There's a a really important point that you make there, Chris, that I think is worth restating. Mm -hmm. I often hear um, Democrats who worry about the next Trump presidency say that, oh, it's going to be so much worse because the world is so much worse now. For some reason, during his first term in global politics, there were no wars, there were no big crises that the Mm -hmm. U.S. was involved in. And then, of course, the mirror image of that, if you're a Trump supporter, is how did the world get so much worse? It helps him to say, you know, now suddenly there's this war in Ukraine mm. and there's the war in the Middle East. And, and you know, Trump supported the Afghanistan withdrawal, of course. But the, but the argument that he makes is to say, I would have done it better. I would have shown more strength. Who knows if that's true? But it's a very seductive theory to say through deterrence through strength and then deal making. Um, to avoid more wars. I think that that's a really, really important point, Chris. So is it fair to say that today, American foreign policy, in the view of the average person, we've gone from a doctrine, an ethos, a DNA, that was an America that was very confident, that was very dominant on the foreign stage, that felt like it could project its power and project its values, democracy, capitalism. And now we're at a place and the beginning maybe of an era where average Americans want to avoid forever wars, as they put it, and want to just make sure that they're getting the benefit of capitalism, and it's not happening at their expense because they felt over the past 20 years the, you know, middle class or blue-collar workers that capitalism and globalization has happened at their expense. Has this shift happened in your view, and is it here to stay? Because that would have real consequences on the relationship between the U.S. and Europe to start with. This is happening at a time of the rise of China. So I think China's rise, you kind of mentioned this earlier about this concept or this thinking amongst many Americans about rich Europe, capable Europe. This is not Europe of the post-Second World War period. They can kind of handle their own issues in their own backyard. And I think that amongst, and I don't think it's amongst all Americans, but especially we see it with Trump's base, this, okay, China is eroding America's strength, which is our industrial our industrial strength, especially when you kind of put in the context of the financial collapse and the automotive collapse of the early 2000s, I think there is this base that China's to blame for. I think there's, mm-hmm. I mean, obviously that stems from, you know, the deal that was struck with, you know, Nixon and all and all, all of the other stuff. I don't think Americans necessarily see it that way, but I think it's definitely China is becoming stronger. Um, China is, is taking away from our economic base. And yeah, there's this sentiment that, okay, Europeans can handle this. You know, they have expansive railway system. Free college, you know, all these, these things I just kind of think healthcare, healthcare, vacation, yeah, all this. I mean, and I think this is stuff that I see that I think needs to be obviously you know, can be a bit reductive, but I think these are things that are kind of shared. And this is a sentiment that, okay, it's in order to restore American strength, let Europe handle their stuff. And then we're going to shift and look and take on China because China is the real threat. I mean, there's a bunch of polling that says that the a way Americans view the relationship with China has definitely um, degraded where it goes from like competitor to like now enemy. And I think there is a sense that, OK, well, we, we can't do it all at once. Let Europe is handle it. And I think that's definitely um, uh, appreciated amongst the Trump base. And I think, you know, what we even saw, there are. People who might not characterize themselves as MAGA, but people who may, going back to the economy and inflation, may feel that, okay, the economy is not right. Maybe we should blame China for it. So that's how maybe Trump's message becomes more alluring. And you start seeing these subtle demographic shifts that we haven't really seen in recent decades happen. You know, it's interesting you should say that because it reminds me of something that Trump said on the campaign trail where he was basically saying in Pennsylvania in particular, which ended up obviously being sort mm-hmm. of a, a, a very important key key state, at least three times he said he wouldn't spend taxpayers' money on wars in, quote, countries that you've never heard of and don't want to hear of. 
And I wonder how that applies to Europe. Like, does the average American know where Estonia is? I think the Europe case is a little bit different um, mm -hmm. because what Trump has also said about Europe and about the EU is you think it's just these little, nice little rich countries, but actually they're out to get us. I'm, I'm yeah. paraphrasing, right? So I think he's he's playing into that image that Americans have of Europe Which, I mean, they're not wrong. <laughs> they're not wrong on what? They're not wrong on these are wealthy, democratic, stable, relatively uh, ethnically homogenous democracies, right? And uh, there is a very real question that Americans are asking that Europeans should ask, which is why is the U.S. paying for their security? And we're sort of dancing around that question. And I think, mm. you know, a lot of... President-elect Trump's views on foreign policy have become mainstream over the past few years. And this is one that I think lots of Americans of all political colors would probably subscribe to. Another point that I just wanted to quickly raise is you both outlined, I think, two two variants of where the Republican foreign policy is is going. And it's one of the, the questions that we wonder when we wonder where Trump's foreign policy would actually go is would it go more in a sort of restrainer withdrawing from the world's direction or more into a we have to withdraw from Europe in order to focus on China and the in the Pacific direction and then for me if it's the second then I foresee I mean I can't really see voters supporting Donald Trump now supporting for instance a war over Taiwan mm. If you're not supporting a war over Ukraine, it's hard to make the case why you should support a war over Taiwan. But in talking with people in the Trump foreign policy world, when they want to confront China, they don't necessarily agree, all of them, that they need to go to war over Taiwan. Absolutely. That conversation yes. is happening among mm -hmm. themselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I want to go back to Europe because both of you outlined a view, an American view that I think is actually... Uh, uh, very consensual, uh, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, that Americans think that Europe is a wealthy place because they also mostly interact with Europe when it when it comes to vacation or to luxury goods. That's what they see in their mm -hmm. mind. I'm struck by the gap between this perception and how Europeans feel about their wealth, their economic situation, mm -hmm. and their power. And when you're in Europe... There's a real sense of panic over the economic decline and over weakness in terms of geopolitical defense power, even if you have actors like European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen or French President Emmanuel Macron or even Poland as a whole who actually believe that Europe can do more for itself. But this gap in perception, it, I think, has become a real big challenge for the continuation of the transatlantic relationship the way we've known it. So I'd love to get your thoughts on how do you see new terms of this transatlantic relationship if it is to continue being as strong and as foundational as it has been since World War II? Maybe, Sophia, you can start. That's a big question, and mm -hmm. it's a question that we'll be working on, I think, for the next uh, four years at least. Um, Well, first on your, I think, very, very important point, Reem, about the perceptions on Europe's economy, because I think it's important to put a fine point to it. When Americans say Europe is wealthy and wealthy enough to pay for its own security, 100%. I think that can stand next to Europe is economically declining. And that doesn't help the European case in the US either, because one thing that I am really struck by in every conversation I have with U.S. foreign policy thinkers is how much um, the potential for economic innovation and investment of a region plays into whether U.S. thinks of that region as strategically important. So and it's not how much weapons they buy from the U.S.? <laughs> and fortunately, it's not just that, no. Plays into it more, I think, less with voters and more with the defense industrial lobby that then <laughs> has a, an impact on um, Congress. Um, but I think that actually the Draghi report 
we underestimate perhaps in Europe, but you'll tell me if I'm wrong, how that how much that damages also the transatlantic relationship if the US feels that Europe is essentially not catching up and not going where the US is going, whereas other countries in the world have much more economic potential and much more innovation and investment potential and how also the US looks at different European countries and looks at who has the strong economy, who is investing, who, you know, so I think that is an important that's aspect that Poland we sometimes, feels good about that's itself. why Poland feels good about mm. itself. Um, if it doesn't get smacked down by the EU commission over its fiscal policy. Um, so that, that just as an aside on how we have to put the transatlantic relationship on a new footing, I guess I'll, I'll focus on one aspect, which is one that I'm working on a lot on European security and on NATO. I think we have to put meat on the bone of the conversation on the European pillar in NATO. We've had a lot of talk about that and we haven't really, I think, in Europe confronted the reality that a European pillar in NATO is not just a more palatable transatlanticist version of European strategic autonomy. It has to basically mean what we were talking about when we were talking about European strategic autonomy inside NATO because that pillar has to be able to carry the alliance, if necessary, by itself. But does an alliance actually exist without an America that is really deeply involved? Mm. I think that's an open question. It's, of course, it's an open question, but we have no choice but to tackle it now. Otherwise, we'll, put, we'll throw our hands up and say, all right, we're done. So I don't think that's where we're going to go. I think we can and should make a pitch to the Donald Trump White House about how we move on from a conversation about burden sharing to a conversation about burden shifting. The yes wants to shift the burden of European security. And in order to avoid them doing it overnight <laughs> by pulling out troops, for instance, or important capabilities, let's try to make with them together a plan how they can slowly withdraw some of their capabilities or their troops or their personnel in NATO's command and control structures and how we can slowly replace those with Europeans. There capacity some, building. Capacity building. There are some things that we won't be able to replace in, even in the medium term, like the U.S. nuclear umbrella. But actually, uh, most people in the MAGA universe who are advocating for a much reduced U.S. presence in Europe don't actually advocate for withdrawal of the U.S. nuclear yes. umbrella. That's it's the one thing they keep right. actually completely to the side. Which is a start. That's a start. And then, you know, working with them to say, uh, give us X amount of years. Here's our plan, how we can relieve some of the burden from you. And I think the entryway into even having that conversation has to be defense spending. It has to be an announcement by European allies, a new defense pledge, if you will, um, 3%. Well, exactly. Exactly. 4%, but probably three, let's start with 3% by the end of Trump's tenure, 2028. You know, I'm just throwing out things here, but that is your entryway into then hopefully having a more constructive conversation with Washington. And we all know there's no guarantees here to go horribly wrong, but yeah. we have no chance but to try you it You have now. to throw things at the wall and see what sticks. Yeah. Chris? Yeah, I mean, I'm happy that you mentioned the, the defense spinning aspect because there's... Uh, a thread there when it comes to U.S. domestic conversations. And I'm thinking about, I know we've so far talked a lot about like Trump and the MAGA base, but I'm thinking about even on the American left, there is this sentiment around potentially NATO being like a vassal of U.S. power. Um, you mentioned U.S. primacy earlier. And I think there's a serious conversation that needs to be had in the U.S. that, that is there's a conversation being had, but I don't think being taken seriously around defense spending. You know, um, I mean, I think RFK talked about cutting the defense budget in half, which is probably extreme. But like these are things that Americans are throwing out there. I mean, Bernie Sanders has talked about it. He's on the American left. And I think there needs to be a serious um, conversation about how can we um, – address this like strategically, but also realistically. I think there's concern about Americans. You, you hear a lot of talk about 800 military bases, you know, essentially the U.S. empire, so on and so forth. And I think that kind of lends to this perception, whether wh whatever aisle you're on, about, you know, the U.S.-Europe um, relationship and whether it's one that's transactional, whether it's one where the U.S. is kind of footing a, a majority of the bill and, and usury. And I feel like to get to a point where we can make a solid case for the U.S., um, your relationship and for NATO um, is one that takes Americans' concerns about defense spending seriously. When we think about, we just mentioned a lot of like social welfare 
um, programs that the U.S. does not have. Um, so I think tackling the conversations around defense spending, tackling conversations about 800 military bases around the world, um, tackling conversations around U.S. presence in Europe. Um, I wish I could give like a really concrete answer, but I think that can kind of start to really address, I think, real concerns about American defense posturing here domestically that could then translate into, a, I think, a healthier um, view of, uh, you know, U.S. NATO, U.S. Europe relations. You know, I think we really went to the heart of how to talk to the American population, which, by the way, on a basis that it's bipartisan. Um, I do also recognize, if for our policymakers who are listening to us, that it's a probably more complex conversation that they need to have with what you were talking about, the military industrial complex mm -hmm. in the U.S. and also Congress people. And they have to find a way to reconcile these two messages that are not necessarily always the same, because obviously Congress people want to keep those European mm -hmm. euros coming in, yeah. buying the stuff that the factories produce in their own uh, districts. But as Chris was saying, uh, the American population wants its its government to spend maybe a little less on defense and a little more on social stuff and on infrastructure and on reducing inflation. And I think what is important for Europeans is we're going to spend much more money on defense. We're going to invest in capabilities. We're going to invest in European defense firms. Some of that money is obviously going to go to the United States, not just to curry favor, but because this is where um, the capabilities, some capabilities are available quicker and better. Not all of that money needs to go here. I think what's important is that we present this as a win-win deal, which it is. If the overall pie is getting bigger, everybody's getting more money. The U.S. defense production capacity is not currently able to fill all the gaps on both sides of the Atlantic. And so I think it's actually possible and there's more of an opening there than we sometimes think. The harder questions for Europeans, I think, is what we talked about earlier, which is the guns versus butter framing that I think we have to counter when we're talking about defense more defense spending. We're far from where we are in the U.S. I don't think that we actually should go where the U.S. is with the disproportionality of its defense budget. Um, but it also doesn't mean that if we invest more money into defense, this is going to come out of schools and pensions. If we allow for a little bit more fiscal flexibility, if countries like Germany get around their uh, obsession with the debt break, if we allow for, for instance, joint borrowing at EU level to give a bit more flexibility to spend more money on defense while not at the same time stirring up populist sentiment over where that why that money isn't going to the home front. You know what? Come to Carnegie to, for a bit of actually positivity and, and optimism. Win-win. Mm. That's what alliances <laughs> oh, should be about. <laughs> now it's tough, but that's what we're going to leave it at. Chris, Sophia, thank you so much for having this conversation with me. Thank, thank you. you Reem. Thanks. For those of you who are interested in learning more about transatlantic relations, I encourage you to follow the work of Carnegie Europe on X and LinkedIn. Our producer is Mattia Bagherini. Our editor is Futura d'Aprile of Europod. Sound engineering and original music by Jeremy Bouquet.